here with Michael Yancey, and we're asking him about his dish, chicken and noodles. Say hi, Michael. Hello. So, Michael, why chicken and noodles? I picked this dish because, as far as I know, this is a unique Johnson family dish. That's my great-grandma's family. And then it passed down to the Hindmarshes, who's my grandma's family, and then down to my family. And um, we're the only ones that I know of that serve soup on top of mashed potatoes. And then you have a coworker, an old coworker, that serves noodles on top of mashed potatoes. But to my knowledge, those are the only two people I know of that serve noodles on top of mashed potatoes. And we're the only ones that serve soup on top of mashed potatoes. I'd say that's true. It's kind of a weird dish, but I love it. So what would you say is the most important part of this dish? Well, I'd say that's the chicken, because without the chicken, it kind of, you know, falls apart. It's the most important part because you boil the chicken to make the stock, and then you boil the noodles in the stock, thus flavoring them so that you get the chicken flavor throughout. And then you drizzle a little bit of the stock on top of the mashed potatoes so that they are kind of chicken flavored. And then, of course, you scoop your noodles into the potatoes as you take a bite. So there's that chicken flavor all throughout. So it's really the chicken that's the most important part. So what is the history of this dish for you and in general? Um, well, first off, I did research into chickens as part of the assignment, of course, but also because chickens are kind of um, the unsung heroes, I think, of cuisine, because they're kind of bland tasting, but they're also really fascinating. And one of the most interesting aspects of doing the research is that I found out that eating chickens is kind of a recent development in so far as breeding chickens. Like, I read an article from the Smithsonian that if we were to go back to ancient Egypt and bring one of these ancient Egyptians up and they were to look at our chicken culture, they would be amazed to find out we eat chickens because they bred chickens to fight. And that's what most people have done throughout human history is they bred chickens as entertainment, not to eat. And when we did breed chickens for eating purposes, it was for the eggs, not for the meat. That's a fairly recent thing. And we did, of course, eat chickens, but it was really only when they reached what I like to think of as retirement age, when they got old and weren't used for anything else. But not really until basically the post-World War II era did they really get industrialized, and then that became this big meat-producing thing, and that's when we get this kind of modern era of chicken-producing uh, conglomeration that we kind of think of today, where chicken is actually the most popular meat that we as Americans eat nowadays. But the modern chicken that we can go out and buy today that we would eat, that's nothing like what my great-grandma would have made her chicken and noodles out of. Um, when I talked to my mom in researching this, uh, she had said that when grandma would make this dish, she would make it out of an old rooster when he reached, as I said, retirement age. And it's nothing like what a modern grocery store chicken is like. That bird was much smaller, way more tough, and much more difficult to cook. So the only real option that grandma had to cook was to boil it, because that's the only way you could break down the connective tissues and the protein in a way that would make it even edible. And so by boiling it, she could cook it long enough to make it edible, but then also she could make it so the uh, meat was able to be spread out over her seven kids, four of whom were boys, and they were, these were big guys. I, I remember my Uncle Bud, my grandma's immediate younger brother and the oldest of the boys, and he was a big guy. So this guy needed a lot of food to keep him going. And in order for them to just be able to get any meat, you had to figure out some way to get this one bird to feed everybody, and soup was the obvious uh, option. So 
this was a brilliant way to take one bird and feed your entire family. And then the other way, or the other brilliant way that she did it was she took noodles and had those carbs, and then she took mashed potatoes and put the noodles on top of the mashed potatoes, and so you had this incredibly carb-heavy meal that you didn't have to have big portions for, and then you could eat your very small portion, but you still had a lot of carbs, and then you could go out and work for the rest of the day. That's fascinating. Um, so I know from my personal experience, when you first made me this dish, I was a little shocked by it because as you just said, it is very carb heavy and wow, that's a weird dish. <laughs> Noodles on top of potatoes. Um, so this is a dish you had growing up a lot. Mm -hmm. It's got a lot of good memories for you. Tell me about your favorite memory with this. Uh, when I was a very young kid, we went down to Provo and mostly as a way to keep me out of trouble because I was a very accident prone kid and my grandma had a very specific way she liked to keep her house. And so this was a way to help me help her, but also as a way to keep me under her control. She had me help her make the dish. And so I didn't understand the politics of it. I was just happy to help, but she had me help her prep the chicken and then help her get the water boiling and get the noodles made and get the potatoes mashed. And I was just happy to help. But then she told me the story about how her grandma invented the dish and how she would eat this when she was a little girl. And then we got to set the table. And I remember sitting at that table and grandma had this really beautiful dining room and she had this really big black table that was made of very heavy wood and her chairs were made out of the same kind of wood that, when, as a little kid, it seemed like they weighed about three or four tons each. And the wood was very thick, dark lacquer that seemed to absorb all of the light like a black hole. And we were a fairly small family. And there were just the four of us plus grandma and grandpa, but just those two more just made it seem like there was a whole crowd of people there. And because grandpa was so loud and he would tell all of his stories it seemed like there was this huge crowd so sitting there at grandma and grandpa's table with all of my family around it was just this big boisterous loud experience and i was so happy and i was so having so much fun that it was this great memory and that's why i think even to this day, chicken and noodles for me is the quintessential comfort food. And as I was thinking about it, that's why I think comfort food tends to be a lot more about the ingredients than it is the actual food itself. Comfort food tends to run more towards the less healthy options. It's not usually about salad. It's not usually about food that's good for you. It's more about the memories that we associate with these foods, I think, than it is the actual food itself. So, so as you already said, you think this is the quintessential comfort food, which is interesting for me because I look at my comfort food, which is crock pot roast beef, mashed potatoes, good gravy, good gravy, man, um, and some, some kind of veggie. But to me, the reason that's comfort food is because I have such amazing memories of my mom making that and coming home from church on fast Sunday and I am starving and I just want something good to eat and you walk in and you smell that and you just want to go peel pieces of the meat off and it's amazing to me how comfort food whether it's my comfort food or your comfort food just instantly brings so much memory and so much happiness and the reason it is comfort food is because it's comforting it brings you those memories and i love that i think comfort food in order to be comfort food has to have some aspect of home to it and that's why it's comfort food it's not comfort food if it brings back memories of camp or if it brings back memories of the hospital or something like that it brings back memories of home and that's where you're the most comfortable and for me, chicken and noodles brings back memories of that day at grandma's house. And then with it, 
the memories of her memories of her home and then my mom's memories of her home because as grandma was telling me the history of this dish then she was also telling me about my mom's memories of this dish because she made it for my mom when she was a little girl and then my mom of course made it for me when i was a little kid and so there's this long chain of memories that it all encapsulated for me and of course it doesn't hurt that it's this very thick rich very carb heavy dish that just kind of wraps you up in this very thick warm heavy happiness and it makes you logy and satisfied and happy when you eat it you're, you're just too heavy when you're done to do much other than just lie there and be happy and I think that's another aspect of good comfort food is it just kind of makes you too thick and heavy to be anything other than happy. So I have just one last follow-up question for you. Okay. You've, you've listed this string of memories, and you, I know, plan on making this a family dish for your family mm -hmm. and a comfort food for your children. How do you now make this dish your own and make it unique to you but still honor that history? Like any good folklore, because I think this is what uh, a folklorist would call um, folklore, is that you have to add a little bit to it. So when my grandma made it, my great-grandma, because out of necessity, because this was a very much a Depression-era dish, she couldn't really do very much. It was very basic. It was salt, it was chicken, it was potatoes, and that was pretty much it. Now, because I live in a lot more plenty, I can add garlic, I can add cream cheese, and I do. And this is one of the very few dishes where I'm, I don't really like doodling it up very much. I don't add a lot of fancy schmancy stuff to it, which is very rare for me. I like making a lot more additions to it. But I don't add a lot to the broth. I don't add a lot to the potatoes. But I do add some things, like I said, with the cream cheese to the mashed potatoes, because I like a good stiff mashed potato to stand up to the broth. And I do add some herbs and such. To, I think my one real contribution is the cream cheese to the, the mashed potatoes and a little bit of, of garlic and chives to the mashed potatoes because garlic mashed potatoes, that, that's just good stuff. Well, thank you, Michael. I've really enjoyed interviewing you today and I hope you had a good time as well. Oh, always. Awesome. And we're signing off.